What I want to talk about is what it means to have a collection of art from all over the world studied and thought about as a collection from all over the world rather than coming from particular cultures. It is, I think, one of the first collections conceived in that way from the beginning. Collections like the British Museum, like the great uh, encyclopedic museums, grew into that. This was thought from the beginning as an opportunity to present art of the whole world in one place. And I think that offers the most remarkable opportunities to pose questions and address issues uh, that are of the greatest importance today. And I want to start as it's a Sainsbury uh, benefaction. And having worked in the National Gallery and the British Museum, we've also, in both institutions, uh, benefited enormously from the generosity of that remarkable family. Obviously, we have to start with food uh, in some sense. Um, so at a slight uh, dislocation, I want to start with a dinner plate. <laughs> it is uh, a press out of perfectly ordinary dinner plate, but it is in fact not an ordinary one at all. It has on it the arms of Admiral Anson, and it was a dinner service commissioned by Anson in the late 1740s to commemorate his circumnavigation of the world. Uh, he sails around the world attacking various people on the way and looting various things on the way um, in the 1740s, makes an enormous fortune, comes back and uh, is duly elevated and commissions the dinner service. And on one side you see the port of Plymouth, on the other side you see the port of Canton. Um, it's quite difficult to sort out which is which, um, which is not without interest in itself. Um, and it is, of course, Chinese export porcelain. But it does mean that sitting to eat in the 1750s, Anson dined between England and China. He dined in a totally global context at almost the first moment in history when that was possible. And that's really where I want to start, because the idea of this kind of collection is an idea that is possible only in the 18th century, in Europe, and above all, in England, when for the first time it's possible to be in regular sailing contact with the whole world, where you can think about the cultures of the whole world as things you can gather, compare, collect, and where you have not only a maritime structure but an economic structure that makes it possible. Anson paid for his dinner set uh, without question in Spanish pieces of eight, uh, but probably ones like these. Uh, silver mined by the Spaniards in South America, sent across the Pacific to Manila, the great Spanish galleons, and then marked with chop marks in China to show that they were proper silver, uh, silver that economic historians know totally uh, dislocated the economy uh, of the Far East, and became, by the middle of the 18th century, a total global currency. Everybody wanting silver, everyone wanting coinage, used Spanish pieces of eight, even the British. When the British in New South Wales ran out of coinage and silver, they took Spanish pieces of eight. Unfortunately, Spanish pieces of eight had on them the head of the King of Spain, which was obviously awkward. So the solution was fairly straightforward. Um, and uh, this is the British currency of New South Wales um, uh, at the end of the 18th century. Um, and it does make the point that what we're looking at at this moment is really the first globalised moment of economy and of culture. And it's in that world that the British Museum is created. Set up in 1753 by Parliament because it was clear that if Britain was going to trade with the world, it needed to understand the world. It's important, I think, to insist that it's a pre-imperial creation in that sense. This is before the great moment of empire. This is, uh, I mean, there are of course the colonies in the West Indies and in America, but for the rest, this is about understanding the world, trading with it, and that great enlightenment project of comparing the world and how different societies did the same thing. It is, I think, fair to say the British Museum is the first physical monument to the global economy. Uh, and you could say it's the greatest surviving monument of the Enlightenment. 
and where the French did the Enlightenment with a book, the Encyclopédie, very characteristically, the British did it through things, gathering things and the rather uh, unthought through hope that ideas would emerge if you put enough things together. Um, and that somehow, somehow, we would wind up understanding the world. In the Enlightenment Gallery, we've tried to recover that idea, uh, showing the kind of objects gathered. And the purpose was, of course, that great Enlightenment idea, ideal, idea, ideal, that if you look at how different societies address the same issues, whether it's faith, power, death, religion, whatever, you will discover that essentially we are all alike. And the fascinating thing is to consider how we differ and why, but that the fundamentals are the same. That was the point of the whole collection. It was not initially a collection of art, although it has some very great works of art in it, and that's one of the differences, of course, between the, the, the Sainsbury Centre here. But the purpose was that from this gathering, a new kind of understanding would emerge, that you would be able to understand the world, such as the reading room at the heart of the museum, and create some kind of system that would enable you to make sense of the experience of it. Um, 